depending on what we discover is wrong with their sleep, that's when the work really gets started. And the average duration of us caring for that patient is approximately three to six months because fixing sleep is not something that happens in one consultation. It's usually a three to six month journey of trying different things, uh, starting off with things that make sense and meeting with them every two weeks. The patients can text us through the app, you know, as many times as they want to. Uh, we can jump on a phone call same day, next day if required, but we typically meet with patients twice a week uh, to track progress and continue to navigate into a direction of healthier sleep over time. Nothing in this podcast is intended to render legal, financial, medical, or other professional information. Because the details of your situation are fact-dependent, we highly encourage you to find a recommended individual that you can trust to give you the expertise that you need related to your situation. Well, good morning or good evening, Docpreneur Nation. You're listening to Concierge Medicine Today's Docpreneur Leadership Podcast. And today we have a physician and a leader in his space. We have Dr. Sahil Chopra, and he's with Empower Sleep. Uh, I'm going to let him explain what his background is, how he got into healthcare, and how he really dove deep into sleep. I did not mean to rhyme there. Sorry. But Dr. Chopra, thank you for being our guest today. Oh, thank you, Michael. It's been a uh, been excited about conversing with you like this, um, conversing with the community about sleep medicine. Uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, you know, today we're going to talk about the physiology of healthy sleep. How do concierge doctors, as well as any type of doctor, start incorporating sleep, better sleep health conversations into their practice, into patient, the physician patient. Uh, conversation that you have, because sleep is such an important part of everybody's life. We we hear that as a platitude so often uh, when we hear mattress sales, right? Like, hey, sleep is a big part. You need to buy a new mattress. We're not selling mattresses today, but we want to talk about how do we better understand sleep? How do we do it differently? How do we test for sleep differently? And Dr. Chopra is going to help us understand the physiology of healthy sleep and so first question for you is what what garnered your interest into sleep? What was your was your family of of sleep physicians? You come from that or what what guy gained interest in that? Yeah, it's it's been an interesting journey. Um nobody in my family is a physician, so we're I'm one of the first of our many generations. Um and I have a pretty humble beginnings. You know, I'm an internist by training, did residency at UCLA. I then specialized in pulmonary and critical care medicine at Loma Linda and in California. And then I, there, it was during that time where I became interested in, in sleep medicine. And a couple of things happened at that time. Uh, one was we had a young family at the time and we had two kids in under two and a half years and it was just a very busy time in my life at home and for the physicians that are listening to the show um, they probably are aware that pulmonary and critical care is a very busy fellowship it's not uncommon to be working 75 80 hours a week and i was burning both ends of my candle and I became very sleep deprived chronically uh, during those few years and started to to witness and feel the the consequences of like chronic sleep deprivation. Mm. That was my personal story. And then around that same time, as a pulmonary fellow, we took care of patients who had a breathing sleep breathing problem called sleep apnea. And I would see these patients come into clinic and it would take them months to get into clinic, months to get a sleep study, months, months to get started on any kind of treatment. And because I myself was having like a personal sleep disruption that was going to get better as soon as I finished fellowship, the fact that it took people this long to find some kind of a solution, it, it bothered me. And in hope 
to learn more and be a part of the solution, I decided to do a sleep medicine fellowship. Mm -hmm. And I luckily uh, matched in Boston, was at Harvard for my sleep medicine training. And my interest in sleep medicine has expanded ever since. Wow. So in looking at some of those, you know, in the fellowship and what you've learned in this about sleep disorders, you know, it affects a lot of people. And one of the things that you've probably studied and at length and have seen firsthand is, you know, how that impacts busy physicians. Um, let's speak to the physicians for a moment versus, you know, speaking uh, generally to physicians who can help their patients, but what thoughts or advice or recommendations do you have for physicians who are listening and learning about sleep? And there's things that that's kind of, they just ask general primary care internist type of questions to their patients, but they themselves may be suffering from sleep deprivation as well. What's some advice or thoughts that you might have for them or even statistics and, and research that might lead them to get some assistance, some help? For sure. Uh, that's a, I, you know, I, I think as a clinician, having healthy sleep is so critical because so many people outside of your immediate family are dependent on you. Mm -hmm. So like you are a much stronger lever for other people when your own health is as optimal as possible. And and sleep is one of the foundations for that. And, mm -hmm. and, and for like for physicians, I think one way to think about this is what stage they are in their life from a training standpoint, because sleep disorders or sleep issues during training are very different than sleep issues as if someone is retired as a, or not retired, but later in their career, but older, the kinds of problems that one may encounter are, are different based on the circumstances that they're in. And so sleep disorders in residency are similar to what I witnessed was like insufficient sleep opportunity, um, shift work, sometimes working days, sometimes working nights, and that some of that goes into working as a clinician, either in private in the concierge practice where one may be extending themselves beyond um, office hours or maybe stuck on a computer late in the evening hours. And that itself could lead to some degree of uh, sleep loss. Uh, through the form of uh, screen time in the evening hours or insufficient sleep opportunity. Uh, if on top of that, if a physician has other health concerns, such as obesity, diabetes, heart failure, or any of those things, then there's a whole host of different sleep disorders that could also be prevalent, like sleep apnea, insomnia, restless legs, and those need to be addressed slightly differently. But doing a sleep test is like a good way to start and asking yourself the question, how do I feel when I wake up in the morning? Do I feel sleepy or tired during the day? Can I easily fall asleep? And is my sleep relatively consolidated? Meaning, is it free of a lot of nighttime awakenings? If I ask myself these four questions, it's a very easy way to screen yourself for do I need to get evaluated from a sleep standpoint. Well, that kind of opens up a conversation in a, a few different pathways. And so I'll try to, to, to knock on the door of one or two of those. So when we think about sleep from a physician perspective or from a patient perspective, one of the first things that comes to mind is, well, a sleep test, you know, that's been done for years. And interestingly enough, your conversation that we've had off air and before this conversation, you know, is very similar to the one that I recently had in audiology, where we've done this way of testing for so long that that seems to be the only thing that gets paid from a, you know, financial perspective, it gets reimbursed, but then it's not like, yeah, it's, it's been done and it works, but it, there's so much, 
there's a better way to do it. So what are we getting wrong in the, you know, or I wouldn't say necessarily wrong, but how can we do sleep testing better? And that's one of the things that you're doing there at Empower Sleep. Yeah, it's a great, um, great segue. And, and also an interesting parallel, because I think the similar thing is happening in many different fields. Diabetes is one of them where continuous glucose monitors and diabetes monitoring wasn't being covered in the beginning, but over a course of time, it's shown its value. And now it's something it's become the standard of care. And I suspect this way of doing audiology testing will hopefully become the standard of care in the future too. But when it comes to sleep, I think one fundamental thing that didn't make sense, but we did it because of a lack of resources in the past was the idea of a one night sleep test. Uh, you know, we we know that, and we've all experienced that different nights people sleep differently. Mm -hmm. So if this physiology of sleep varies on a night to night basis, then most certainly the pathology of sleep will also vary on a night to night basis. And if we just do a one night sleep test, it's kind of a snapshot into one's sleep rather than what we really need is as we move into personalized medicine is we need trends of one's health over time, trends of one's sleep over time to then be able to make more personalized recommendations on what could be a way to treat that. And also what are drivers of certain kinds of trends? If I do X, Y, and Z, what happens to my sleep? And if I do X, Y, and Z, um, then how do, how, do, how do things possibly change? So we've kind of developed this ability to do what we call longitudinal sleep testing, where patients, uh, members can do sleep testing over many, many nights over time to see what's working and what's not working. And the clinicians can build very personalized curated care plans depending on the results. So you're working with a lot of data at your disposal, but you're doing it in a different way than just your, your typical sleep test. And one of the things that we then think of when we knock on another door is we think of apps and we think of the, the rings and we think of the watches out there that are helping us to 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 sleep track, and some of that data is informative, um, but it, I think we can go deeper, and that's where you're going a little bit or quite a bit deeper because you're not just doing a snapshot, but then the apps help a little bit with well, here's some of the trends, but then you know often in as is in primary care visits that are ten minute, fifteen minute appointments, the idea of like getting around to your sleep data on your device and talking about it, you know, uh, yeah, but that's not the, that's not why you're here today. Let's, let's address why you're here today. We'll talk about that another time. And then nothing ever gets talked about uh, as the months go by. So talk to us about the, some of the technology and um, uh, around how you're gathering that data and not just doing a snapshot, but getting the trends. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so the technology that we're using, just uh, some of your listeners might be on audio, but it's basically a ring, a silicone ring that goes on your finger. It looks like an oximeter. It's not as aesthetic as um, the Aura ring that is available as a consumer device, but it's it's very comfortable. Uh, the ring gets the data from the ring gets processed through an algorithm called cardiopulmonary coupling (CPC) and uh, the analysis of CPC is FDA cleared to aid in the diagnosis of different sleep disorders. And this technology has been around for a decade, but it's only been, it's been used in like a one night, two night fashion. And more recently, there's hundreds of sleep labs that are using these same tools. Mm. But what Empower Sleep has done is we've taken this technology and wrapped it into a much better user experience where the patient now has access to their sleep testing data 
every morning over time, as well as the ability to connect to like a cloud clinic of sleep doctors who can then give the patients guidance as well as prescriptions for the appropriate treatment, while at the same time, patients can continue to track their progress using these recorders to get to a point of what is hopefully as optimal sleep as physiologically possible. Hmm. You said something interesting there. Well, you said a lot of things that were interesting there, but a couple of the things I'm going to ask the questions because I, I like going down little rabbit trails. Um, cloud clinics of sleep doctors and consulting with the world's, you know, some of the world best experts on sleep. Um, cloud clinics. That that to me is that that is a great term, uh, and I think something that we're talking more and more with younger physicians who are entering the space of concierge medicine, but also in general in their specialties. And they're imp they're starting to look at how do we better serve the next generation patient? What are they, how do they want to connect with us? And sleep is such an important part of all of every person's life, every patient's life. It impacts every single one of us. And so when you're consulting with some of these younger generation patients, they're in their 30s, their 40s, even you know, in their 20s. What are some of the trends that you're, what are some of the conversations you're having with them? Or, you know, what are some of the, the, the data that's fascinating to you that you're like, wow, we can, we can make a difference right away. Or this is, I'm noticing a trend that's in younger patients and anxiety, or what's some of the, what are some of the unusual things and in, in neat, uh, neat things you're discovering? There's many the first is the inf our our sleep is very resilient yet very fragile mm. and a lot of many younger individuals who have symptoms of say insomnia or uh difficulty with falling asleep um a big driver when when we start doing sleep testing over time and we have objective data we're able to tease out what is influencing their sleep in what kind of a way and if we start helping them build healthier sleep habits of say leaving the phone outside of the bedroom limiting building a screen building a routine that is of that is that is some kind of a wind down routine before sleep um doing breathing exercises or meditative exercises just by the process of elimination of noise we can help people pretty significantly and we've made it normal to to have a large amount of stimulus in the evening hours. Mm -hmm. But it's not physiologic. Just because it's common, that does not mean it's really normal. And that's a big driver of a disruption of human sleep. Um, that, that's one trend that we're observing. The other trend that we're observing is the prevalence of sleep uh, disorders is probably higher than what we think it is. Uh, when we start testing people who are sleep curious or with the use of these consumer grade wearables, uh, patients are being made aware what the health of their sleep is when they may or may not necessarily be significantly symptomatic because they have a good reserve uh, we're able to identify these individuals sooner and help them change their habits or intervene sooner to solve the problem so I, I think the other trend is the prevalence of sleep disorders is probably a little bit higher than what we think it is uh, and the 
Yeah, and, and and I'll leave it there. Um, and we can dissect some of these things if if you feel appropriate. Yeah, I we did an interview with a psychologist earlier this year, and usually a title for the podcast or a title for the webinar comes out of the conversation that I have with the guest. And um, one of the things that I noticed that my wife and I participated in through our insurance plan was a sleep. It wasn't a competition, but it was like a sleep tracker kind of um, one month engagement kind of thing through, through an app. And you upload your data and and really what we found was it was creating more anxiety for us. And uh, when I met with our health coach, uh, who we do monthly, we enjoy those monthly meetings with with them because it, it does keep us accountable. But one of the things I shared with them was like that sleep app thing, like it was it was helpful for like the first two, three days, but then eventually we found ourselves it was creating anxiety because we were trying to chase sleep and chasing sleep is uh, versus you said something interesting there, sleep reserve. Um, what is a sleep reserve if there is such a thing? But I, th I think that there probably is because when we think about being sleep deprived and I'm getting ready to go on a, uh, a trip and a family reunion and I've got, you know, 16 hour travel days. And then once I get there, I need to be on, right? Like you got to be on when you go visit family and they want to visit with you and soak up as much time. So you're spending, you know, you're dipping into that sleep reserve of like, hope I get enough sleep while I'm on vacation, you know, so that I can be aware, uh, but also, you know, feel rested when I get back. So there's a couple of questions in there related to what is a sleep reserve? Um, but also what are people doing that is wrong in chasing sleep? And maybe that's not a question, but more of a commentary. Yeah. Um, the idea of sleep reserve kind of stems from any kind of physiologic reserve. So for example, a young, so I work in the intensive care unit as well. And let's say I'm taking care of somebody who is critically ill in the unit and they're 35, physically fit, muscular, no significant comorbidities and gets admitted for septic shock, uh, some bloodstream infection. And that individual will recover faster than say a 75 year old who is elder or frail less muscle mass, uh, maybe some underlying kidney disease, maybe some underlying cardiovascular disease, some vascu some general vascular disease, cognitive impairment, that person will have a much slower recovery. They have a much lower physiologic reserve. Similarly, that, that concept can be applied to sleep. If an individual has healthy sleep to begin with, if they sleep deprive themselves or they inflict some kind of jet lag or if they are traveling or uh, they have some acute stressor in life that doesn't allow them to sleep as well, that person will, will respond much better than somebody who has underlying sleep disorder, a circadian rhythm problem, sleep apnea, restless legs, or just poor sleep poor sleep quality to begin with. And a really good example that we see often is people who just had a new child. If mm -hmm. someone would had a new child, if someone was a good sleeper to begin with, and then they have a new child, and then there is some level of sleep disruption, the good sleepers are able to navigate those circumstances much better then if somebody was already a poor sleeper to begin with, now has a new child, a new mother, a new father, the amount of emotional breakdown that is from even a, a, a further reduction in the amount of sleep, it becomes more obvious to, to them and the people around them. So sleep reserve is more of an idea of people having healthy sleep at foundation, and it is just it gives them more stability to to bend in, in circumstances when required. 
Um, so we want sleep to be as physiologic as possible from the get-go. We want it to be free of disease, free of pathology uh, at baseline. Uh, so that's the idea of sleep reserve. Are you coming across and meeting with more and more new parents um, who I'm, I'm removed from that by about 10 years, but I remember leaving the hospital and going to our first pediatric, you know, visit. And I, what I appreciated about that visit and every physician pediatrician has some, has different opinions. Wow. A lot of opinions out there on, you know, do you use the bassinet and keep them in your room or do you not, you know? Um, and one of the things I appreciated about our particular, and I, I was like, I, I don't even know if we could find that same position anymore. I don't even know if he's, he's still practicing, but you know, he gave us, he really took an interest in our, the parents sleep. And I felt like that was probably fairly rare where the focus is usually always on the child as it should be. But at the same time, he had a unique focus as well in our conversation initially of, look, your role is the caregiver and you you need to make sure that you're taking care of yourself too as parents to be able to care for this newborn. Um, when you're having those uh, virtual consults and in-person consults, are you uh, having a conversation with more new parents or is it usually something that uh, a lot of pediatricians and others are saying, you know, yeah, we, we ask the question, you get six to eight hours of sleep. You're, you're good. You know, and we just glaze over it. What type of trends are you seeing with new parents? New parents is not the primary cohort of people that we take care of. Um, so I don't think I would be the best person to give context on, on new trends. I was just using that as an example because many of us have been through those circumstances uh, of, you know, having children or being acutely sleep deprived, uh, postpartum. Um, so I'll just sort of leave that open-ended right now. No, I appreciate that. Cause that, that is important. Um, but you also said something of interest in there and that was the treatment and that spurred something in, in my head of what treatment options are available. And one of the things that I appreciate you guys talking about on empowersleep.com and you can go to empowersleep.com. We'll put it at the link in the show notes as well as Dr. Chopra's bio and how to connect with uh, Empower Sleep and what he's doing over there. I love your title, by the way, co-founder and CEO and chief sleep giver. I, that's that's a pretty important title. I think of all the titles besides parent and father and husband, that's the most important one. Also, chief sleep giver at Empower Sleep. Um, I don't know who came up with that title if you did, but that was, that was a good one. I appreciate that one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, but what treatment options, cause you say on, on power sleep, it's, we can go beyond the, the CPAP. It's not just about a CPAP. Uh, and when we think about sleep, we think, oh, well, all right, we, we know this, these are our baselines. These are trends. Some people need sleep CPAPs. You know, and we just kind of move on from there. Um, so what are you doing? What other treatment options do doctors need to know about that you know about and are utilizing that maybe they need to know about as well? Yeah, there's there's many, um, Michael. And, and I think like a, a framework to think about this is instead of jumping into the idea of like, what are treatments? One invitation is let's do a sleep test to see what's wrong in the physiology so that we can come up with a plan to treat that pathology. And, and what I mean is, let's say somebody has knee pain. Um, the way that we typically start off is an exam, and maybe we'll do an x-ray. And then based off of that, we'll come up with a plan. If someone just goes to their primary care and says, I have knee pain, usually they won't just say, here, take some Tylenol or take some Advil, or here's a narcotic. We, we do some kind of diagnostic investigation. Similarly, in sleep medicine, it, it makes sense to do a diagnostic evaluation. It doesn't necessarily happen. It, it, it does not happen as often as it should, because when someone complains of sleep issues, very easy knee-jerk reflexes are, here's some melatonin, here's some trazodone, here's some hydroxyzine, Tylenol PM, 
And that's just become like the standard. But if we do many nights of sleep testing, we can start teasing out what exactly is going on with their sleep and their sleep physiology at that point in time. And so, and then the treatments sort of stem from that. Let's say someone has mild sleep apnea. In a traditional setting, people who have sleep apnea, they automatically buy themselves a CPAP machine um, or say a dental appliance. But the question becomes, okay, if you have mild sleep apnea, how does, so sleep apnea is a breathing problem during sleep. So let's do a few, what we call sleep experiments where we test how do different modalities that improve your breathing, improve your sleep. Those could be breathe right strips, uh, you know, external nose dilators. There are internal nose dilators. There is the idea of mouth taping to help keep the mouth closed. There is the idea of strengthening the tongue. There is the idea of sleeping on your side. So we can start doing many different kinds of sleep experiments to see how that person's mild sleep apnea changes with conservative interventions. But let's say someone has severe sleep apnea. If they have severe sleep apnea and they want to try a CPAP, we can prescribe them a CPAP, have it delivered to their home, and that could be the solution. And if that CPAP is resulting in, say, an 80% improvement from where they were, well, there's still maybe a 20% improvement that could be achieved if we add different modalities to that CPAP itself. CPAP plus X, Y, or Z to help them improve their breathing and sleep. Um, so that's like an example in the setting of sleep apnea. Let's say someone has insomnia without sleep apnea. In that situation, we we do what's called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI. And CBT is the, the main first line treatment for people who have chronic insomnia. And it's basically behavioral interventions identifying what are some of the behaviors that individual has that is maladaptive to sleep and helping them peel off those behaviors and replacing them with things that are conducive to sleep. And if on top of that, they do need some kind of a sedative or a hypnotic, through doing additional sleep experiments of say trazodone or gabapentin or any of the Z drugs, we can identify what dose and what medication what, what's the lowest effective dose of what medication will help this individual both subjectively and objectively while we're doing this non-obtrusive sleep test over time? So it's it becomes very granular. It's hard to say, give, give sort of blanket recommendations. A lot of our recommendations are stemmed in what does one intervention result in to the physiology? And let's make precise recommendations based on that. Well, as a parent and, you know, somebody who wakes up routinely at 4 a.m. and starts overthinking retirement and, oh my goodness, are we, should I wake her up and be like, hey, are, do you think we're saving enough at 4 a.m.? You know, I know that's a conversation she does not want to have at 4 a.m., but for some reason, my mind does. Um, as a parent and a patient uh, and you know, someone who has kids that will one day benefit from the advancements in sleep uh, medicine. I want to thank you, first of all, for, you know, creating what you're doing, because there is a better way to do it. Uh, and that leads into the next question of, you know, referrals, reimbursements, um, you know, you're covering over 40 states with Empower Sleep, if I'm correct. Um, but if I'm a physician listening, how do I take the next step? Like, yeah, I don't do enough sleep conversations or questions to my patients about sleep. And it is important. We're all affected by it. How does that physician connect with you, connect with the conversation around sleep better, um, to utilize the, the, 
the stuff that you're talking about today and the stuff that you do and analyze every day? Yeah. Um, first of all, if you're a physician and you're seeking help, uh, just we'll take care of you complimentary. So just if you go to the website and you sign up and in the sign up process, if you mention that you're a doctor, we want to help support doctors in their own well-being so that they can take care of their patients. So we'll take care of you at least for the first month, fully complimentary. Um, and if you're, but if you're a physician who just wants to learn more and wants to allow us to to take care of your patients, if you go to the website and you click on, there's a provider tab on the top of the website. And uh, just when you click on that, there's an option to refer a patient. You can refer a patient using that form. Or there's also a fax number on the website. I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but it's on the bottom of the page and you can re electronically send a fax over and that can work also. And we'll reach out to the patient, get them scheduled uh, for a consultation to see if we can help them. And I know, and you know, because we can laugh about this, but there's going to be some who are listening and, and learning it. And they're like, fax, who still uses fax? And they're going to be like, ah, hello, we both talk to doctors every day. There's a lot of fax machines still out there. <laughs> um, and you can go to empowersleep.com to uh, learn more, to get connected. Um, and your testimonials are just in it. it immeasurably nu numerous. Um, I mean, I'm sure we can, we can find the numbers, but nonetheless, I love that. Um, and I love that you're facilitating direct communication with patients, with physicians, um, about their patients. Uh, and so the invitation that, uh, you know, what invitation do you want to give to physicians to say, okay, you want to take the next step. You've asked some questions. Um, you want to help your patients. So you refer them over to us um, to help them with their sleep, to have a better conversation around sleep, to get some of the trends and some of the baselines and to help come up with some protocols and to, to help fix this um, and a plan of action for their patients. And you're going to consult back with the physician, I presume, to let them know kind of, hey, here's what we discovered as well. Um, but they're handing over some trust to you guys saying, hey, you know what? Sleep isn't just cookie cutter. We can do more. And this or great organization over here, Empower Sleep. And again, y'all aren't, aren't sponsoring. So we're not, I just think this is an important conversation as you do, because it gives me hope as a patient and a parent to know that we're looking at sleep differently in the future. And that, you know, this is going to be a better way to do sleep uh, assistance and to treat sleep in the future for my kids and your kids and, and other physicians listening. So um, as we've learned here, uh, I, I love that you want to see a sleep doctor, take a sleep test and get some treatments um, all from the comfort of your own home. Uh, what's How does that work? Uh, what's their next step besides, okay, I go to the website, I have a patient, I have seven patients. Um, how do I get them signed up? How do they get the ring? Uh, what does what does that conversation and few next next couple of weeks look like for for them or for me as a treating physician? Yeah, uh, it's the same. Whether you know as a patient or a treating physician, will they'll get the same level of uh, care. And what will typically happen is we'll do a. It'll start off with a one hour consultation that will typically get scheduled within the first week depending on the patient's availability. During that one hour consultation, we try to dissect all of the things that might be going on from a general health standpoint, as well as sleep standpoint. After that consultation, the patient will do this two week sleep study where they wear the ring, they download the app, and they track their behaviors and do a series of sleep experiments over a course of two weeks so that we can really endotype and phenotype their sleep and then see how it responds to different extrinsic and extrinsic uh, consequences. And, and then we'll follow up with them with another 30 minute consultation where the, where we then come up with a care plan, depending on what we discover is wrong with their sleep. That's when the work really gets started. 
And the average duration of us caring for that patient is approximately three to six months because fixing sleep is not something that happens in one consultation. It's usually a three to six month journey of trying different things, uh, starting off with things that make sense and meeting with them every two weeks. The patients can text us through the app, you know, as many times as they want to. Uh, we can jump on a phone call same day, next day if required, but we typically meet with patients twice a week uh, to track progress and continue to navigate into a direction of healthier sleep over time. I and then well, when they're done, and then and then when they're done, they mail us a recorder if they if 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 they choose to. So about ten to fifteen percent of patients will say, "Hey, can I keep this and keep checking in with you every?" three months, four months. And we have a more maintenance program in that situation where they just keep the recorder tasked uh, and touch base on an annual, on like an as needed basis. Wow. We, we've we said in previous episodes, you know, show me the data. And I love that you're using data to help understand, to help better understand uh patients sleep like just never before. And that is so encouraging because it just, it just, there's just, it's just nice to know that we're making advancements because we are, we are so inundated with the noise around us that we focus on the now and we don't often th see the innovation that's happening. We talk a lot, it talks a big game at medical conferences about how innovative and fast healthcare in certain aspects is moving, but we don't actually often see it. And I'm happy that this is happening out there. Uh, it reminds me of another conversation we had with NASA uh, PhD and physician where she was similar to your focus is on sleep. Her focus is also on fall prevention. And how do we better look at the data related to if you're going to fall? There's no predictive way to do it exactly, but we can, we can examine trends and data. And so it's nice and encouraging. And I hope that that's the message that so many physicians are getting listening to this is that we're making so much progress in certain areas of healthcare. Sleep is a big one. We can ditch the one night sleep test. We can track your sleep continuously to unlock those really unique personal insights and trends. And we can take a data driven approach that removes this guessing game, which is often how patients feel, right? It's just a guessing game. And I know a lot of physicians will feel that way as well. We're now moving into our lightning round of a couple of questions with our guest, Dr. Sahil Chopra of Empower Sleep. He's the co-founder, CEO, chief sleep giver of Empower Sleep, sleep medicine. And uh, you've done some work at, as you said, Harvard Medical School and um, we're going to ask you a couple of questions. We ask of all of our guests, you can be however um, brief or long-winded as you would like. Um, let's see, where do I want to start? Um, favorite book. It doesn't have to be about sleep, but maybe it is. And what is one that you would recommend to your peers, whether it's pleasure reading for the summer on the beach or in a mountain cabin, or you're like, no, this is an amazing one on sleep. It doesn't matter what it's, what it is. Maybe it's a couple of titles. Yeah, that's a great question. I, there's many, um, over the course, over the course of time, uh, it's shifted from reading books to, to audio books, but I, I think the book that's had the greatest impact on, on how I think is by Simon Sinek, start with the why. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really shaped how how I think and how I th I want our organization to think from why we do the things that we do. Um, probably start with the why. I love that. Um, I just recently listened to a a book yesterday, or maybe it was a podcast. I think it was a podcast about how do we define good. And when you look up in Merriam-Webster, what the definition of good is, 
you know, when we define something, a general good rule of thumb is you, you don't use the word you're trying to define in the definition. Uh, and it was interesting that the word good was also used in the definition of good. Um, but I think that starting with your why, clarifying your convictions, right? And understanding like, here, here's where we want to go. Here's what our, here's what the win is. Um, and so I'm glad to see that, uh, your organization is leaning into uh, those business principles, which are so, so important. Our next question has to do with, um, I'm interested, and I think that this is a curiosity question for those physicians out there. You know, we hear news reports about, you know, this part of the circadian rhythms or this part has extended sunlight. Being that your Empower Sleep is working in 40 different states, am I correct in 40 or is it more? I think it's less? more. Think okay. It's more. So you're working in more than 40 states. You're seeing some trends. Is there one particular part of the country, Midwest, Southeast, Northeast, Northwest, that is getting better sleep than I am in Southeast, you know, the Southeastern United States or you in California? Yeah, I don't know if one is getting better sleep, but what we have observed is on the East Coast, it's kind of allergy season right now. Mm -hmm. And I've observed that during allergy season, there is more nasal congestion. And when there is more nasal congestion, there is worsening in uh, sleep apnea. Uh, there is an increase in sleep apnea burden with with nasal congestion. So that's been one general trend. Like the patients that we see in North Carolina or New York area, there's a lot more allergies and usually sleep is worse when people have allergies. The other, I don't think this is like an annual or a seasonal trend, but people who live at altitude, uh, we take care of a lot of people who live in Utah and Colorado. People who live at altitude tend to, tend to have worse sleep than people who don't live at altitude. Hmm. Um, so those have been like the two areas where people sleep slightly worse, but nothing necessarily that I've identified where people sleep better. Hmm. Well, I can imagine that you're you're a, a new week brings in new data that you've seen before, but you haven't seen before. And you kind of, every week is different. Every, every quarter is going to be different, right? Like with allergy season or, you know, flu season, sleep patterns will change in different areas. And so how interesting is that? It's not a, it's not a question. I'm just saying that is, that is fascinating that you kind of have, almost have this, this cure, clarion call every, every quarter or every month. And you're just like, let's look at the data today. And it's just so powerful to look at that data and to be able to do something about it. And our guest today is the co-founder, CEO, and chief sleep giver of Empower Sleep, doing some amazing things in the world of sleep medicine. Um, all right, couple, last couple of questions. Uh, what does your wind down routine look like? I put the kids to bed mm -hmm. and I'm kind of a early to bed, early to rise person. And I typically fall asleep with the kids. So we have a seven year old, a five year old and a just over a year old baby. And so I usually put the kids to bed and in the process of reading them a book and telling them a story, uh, giving the baby a, a bottle, I usually fall asleep in their bedroom. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of my wind down routine. Um, it's, I don't really have any like extended routine. I'm pretty tired from the, the day that I fall asleep pretty, pretty easily. <laughs> I know I have a, a similar one, but uh, it, it's twofold. When my, once my wife is tucked in our, our youngest, I go in there and then every one of her stuffies that she keeps on her bed has a different personality with a little bit of a different voice. And they're usually a little bit sarcastic and, and funny and some are like more, more needy than others, you know, so we make those stuffies have personalities. And then I go back into where my wife is into our bed 
and I have three pillows. And once I've, you know, kind of gone to like the pillow number one and I've removed the first two pillows, it's like within five minutes I'm out and I'm the good, you know, I'm, I'm the sleeper. And so I was like, you could, y'all can watch whatever you want. And she's like, I've been watching whatever I wanted for 30 minutes now. You've been asleep, <laughs> you know? Yeah. All right. Well, our guest today has been Dr. Sahil Chopra with Empower Sleep. Our last one is one something we ask of all of our guests. And that is, if you were to, you know, if you were to hang up your spurs and just say, you know what, keys to the office are yours to the next person. Um, but, you know, you, you have a story that you're just like testimonial of one of many, I'm sure, that you're just like, you know what, this is why we started this. This is why we did this. What's one story that comes to mind for you that's like, yeah, this is why we do this in healthcare? There's so many. I'm just turning to. to uh, yeah, I, I just one just uh, came to mind. Um, we saw recently saw a lady, probably in her forties, maybe. Uh, lives in, I think Utah or Colorado. Lives at altitude. She, um, about two years ago, had some cardiac event. And at that time, uh, had some percutaneous uh, coronary interventions done, had a stent placed, uh, did well, eventually was diagnosed with, quote unquote, sleep apnea. And over a course of two years and meeting with many, I think two or three different sleep doctors having three or four different in-lab sleep studies and going through three different machines, a CPAP machine, a BiPAP machine, and then an ASV machine. An ASV machine is kind of like, it's a positive airway pressure machine, but it's much more smarter. It's kind of like a ventilator at home mm. for sleep apnea. And, and she didn't feel better. And there was always a lot of night to night variability in her numbers and and from the machine output and eventually she her sleep doctor said i don't know i'm not sure what to do but there's a company that provides like continuous longitudinal testing and why don't you check them out so this patient was referred to us from another sleep doctor for the ongoing care of this individual and what we were able to discover was how the the breathing machine that she had was negatively influencing her breathing during sleep. Wow. She was having a whole bunch of central apneas with this ASV machine. And we had her do a couple of experiments of sleeping without it, and her breathing was healthier. She had mild sleep apnea with nothing, but severe sleep, moderate to severe sleep apnea with the breathing device. And she traveled to sea level for a trip and she took the recorder and she had no sleep apnea at sea level. Wow. Okay. So like it just kind of, she, and then she was so grateful to be able to tease some of this out. And what the final plan eventually was, like, hey, I don't, you're better off not using anything now and maybe consider moving to a place that is not of you know of five six thousand feet as as a more definitive long-term solution but in the meantime if you want to sleep more on your side or um you know use something for mild sleep apnea like we have this is going to be the best solution for you so for her that was a game changer and then we've had uh, we've had other scenarios too where where we have taken people off of CPAP. CPAP is kind of cumbersome. Machine, distilled water, mask, hose, all of these things that need to be cleaned. And we've actually been able to take people off of CPAP who have mild sleep apnea uh, because we help them find a better dental solution or a non-CPAP or some kind of a CPAP alternative. And we're able to objectively show them that this solution is better 
then subjectively and objectively than CPAP. And they would not have had that solution otherwise because that was just the treatment they were prescribed and they weren't aware that they can do different kinds of sleep experiments to see what can work, what else can work and what else does not work. Wow. I mean, I want to applause that. Like, that's just amazing that that y'all are doing that type of work, but also that there's physicians out there who recognize the value of what you all at Empower Sleep are doing that thought enough about their patients and thought enough about, you know, kind of a referral over here to you guys to say, look, we, we don't need to keep going. Like I know somebody else who can help. And that's what I'm so encouraged by too, is that there is a better way to, to, to ditch this one night sleep test. Not to say that it's bad, but at the same time, we can do something differently and go more detailed like you just explained with some of those uh, testimonials. So our guest today has been Dr. Sahil Chopra. He's the co-founder, CEO, and chief sleep giver of Empower Sleep. And he's doing some wonderful things with sleep testing, analyzing the data, showing folks the evidence, and working with doctors to empower them to help their patients get better sleep because it impacts us all. And so we want to thank you for uh, what you're doing uh, by eliminating that guessing game to ensure in optimal outcomes. Uh, you've truly shown that it's no longer about being the best doctor in the world anymore. It's about being the best doctor for the world and for your patients and for your local communities. And you're serving so many, uh, such an important need in our in healthcare. And I hope that more and more people we continue to go and use and learn more about Empower Sleep and about how you can help your patients have a better conversation around sleep, but you can see it with the data and you can work with the doctors at Empower Sleep to learn more about what they're doing and how they can help your patients as well. So Dr. Chopra, thank you for being our guest today. No, thank you so much. It's been a privilege and a pleasure.